This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. All right, one very, very last thing in terms of these formulae. Sorry there's so much, but you see this can make every little bit of this, or almost every bit, could be part of a big investment appraisal question in part A. Everything here could make a nice section B choice question. There's always a good chance of a short question on portfolio and or capital asset. All right? The final bit uh, is something rather different, different. I said that betas are published for all major companies. There are websites, there are magazines where you can look up the beta. So although you can ask those bits about calculation, most of the time in the exam, when you need betas, you'll be told them. The only problem is this, that the published betas they measure the systematic risk and so on, yeah, I'll dealt with all that. But the published betas, they're calculated on shares. They measure the risk of a share. And the problem that gives us and again listen very carefully because well actually a lot of people teach this wrong, let alone understand it wrong. So far I've only been talking about the risk of the business. There's some businesses more risky than other businesses. We've said enough about that. I've also said unsystematic risk we're not concerned about. Okay? It's only systematic. But the trouble is that there's another bit of risk that affects, that makes a share more or less risky. Obviously a share is more risky, less risky, depending on the type of business. That's what we've kept talking about. But the other thing that can make a share more risky, you all remember because we've talked about it before, is the level of gearing in the company. If you know that, you all remember the, what I'm talking about here. Forget any numbers, but the more gearing there is in a company, automatically there's more risk for the shareholders. All right. And the problem is, as I've said, that the risk of a share depends on really two things. It depends on the systematic risk of the business. Which until now is all we've been worried about. I've not mentioned gearing. But whatever the systematic risk of the business is, whether oil companies are high beaters, low beaters, whatever, the share will have more risk in it depending on the level of gearing. It's, if you like, plus, but we don't, as you see, we don't actually add it. But the risk due to gearing... And it relates, make sure you're clear, something um, I just said in reply to Redder earlier, that I said all oil companies, you would expect, in theory, the same beta. The sector. Oil companies might have a beta of two. Uh, telephone companies might have a beta of 0.8, but all telephone companies. Agreed? But the trouble is this, although you would expect all oil companies to have the same systematic risk, 
A highly geared com oil company, the share is more risky than an oil company with less gearing. You see my point? That the gearing, whatever the risk of the actual business is, the level of gearing makes it more risky. Now, are you all clear what I'm saying there? You know, it's nothing to do with unsystematic risk. That's where a lot of people get muddled. Unsystematic risk, we're ignoring. We're assuming we're well diversified. But the beta of a share isn't simply measuring the risk of oil companies, the risk of telephone companies. Because the risk of the share includes the gearing effect. Okay? Now, I'm going to remind you how we actually use this later, but the problem is, for whatever reason, if I want to know the risk of oil companies, the beta of oil companies, all right, I take an oil company share. I look in the newspaper, and I find out, oh, this share has a beta of 2.3. But I actually want to know how risky oil business is. Well, if the beach of the share is 2.3, if there's no gearing, fine, that is the risk of the business. But if the share I've picked has a lot of gearing in it, then part of the reason it's size because of gearing, I need to know what would it be if the gearing wasn't there. I think you see my point. All right? And so again, it was actually an F9, I don't know if you remember, but it was very brief. Uh, what's very likely is in P4, very likely, is that you will need to what we call ungear beaters. That he might give you, and you'll see why very shortly, it's the last bit of just learning arithmetic, but I might tell you the beta of the share is 2.3. Here is the gearing, and ask you, what would be the beta if there wasn't gearing? What's the actual riskiness of oil, of telephone? All right? And here we've got the one last pure beta formula. I've printed it on page 43. A few centimetres down. Uh, the formula, I, it always makes me laugh, the formula always looks horrendous. Some of you might remember, though, when we come to use it, the formula actually becomes a lot, lot, lot simpler. However, to show you, can you turn to example 10? <coughs> Let's do this quick, and then we can show the relevance for appraising projects. Uh, company P has a gearing ratio of 0.4. And note, if ever gearing's there, it will be defined... You probably remember from earlier exams, gearing is sometimes defined as the ratio of debt to equity. Other times it's defined as debt to total, debt plus equity. Do you remember? Yeah. Well, it'll always be defined because there are two ways. Uh, the beta of shares is 1.8. Q, Q has gearing of 0.2. And the beta of its shares is 1.5. All right? Now here, it's just an exercise on the formulae to sort it out. But I've said, first of all, which is the more risky share? Well, which is the more risky share, please? Which of those two shares is the more risky, P or Q? P. You're told the beta of the shares... The beta's measuring the risk of the share. P is 1.8 times as risky as the market. Q is 1.5 times as risky as the market. P is the more risky. Is that clear? No tricks. But the published betas measure the riskiness of the share. The problem is, I am not surprised P is more risky... Because P has more gearing. You agree? And the more gearing there is, the more risky we are. The problem, though, I've asked, which company is the more risky business? 
And there's my problem. The beaters we've got in front of us include the gearing effect. We need to remove the gearing effect. We need to say, what would the beater be if there was no gearing? And that would be measuring the riskiness of the actual business itself. Would you all agree? And so, we need to, what we call, ungear the beater. I'll do one, you can do the other. All right? So be patient with me and check me. Uh, the formula... Sorry, be patient, because I'll write it down, then I can just explain this, make sure we clear about the symbols. Uh, B to A, VE over VE plus VD, 1 minus T, uh, times B to E, plus VD, 1 minus T, over VE plus VD, 1 minus T, B to D. Now, I know I've written down below, but be careful here. It's, again, I can say this because I've taught this enough times. The biggest problem, when there is one, and you all know what it's like in the middle of an exam, is people get muddled up what's what, you know. They, the figures go all over the place. They work the formula beautifully, but it's, you know, doesn't matter how, how, how often you learn the symbols, you sort of get lost. Um, beta A is what we're after. It's the beta without the gearing. It's also called, for fairly obvious reasons, the ungeared beta. It's also called, and the reason the symbol is beta A, it's also called, a bit less obviously, the acid beta. And the examiner could refer to it by either any of those words. If it helps you remember, the reason it's called the acid beta... Hello? Is if we ignore gearing, an oil company might be more risky because they've invested in oil assets, if you understand me. A telephone company might be less risky because they've invested in telephone. It's the assets they've invested in that made the business more risky or less risky. Okay? So that's what we're after, beta A. Well, beta E and beta D. Beta E is the beta of a share. That's the beta of the share, yeah? It's also called the geared beta. Because the gearing will have made the share more risky. It's also called, and that's why it's beta E, the equity beta. Now I'm doing... Um, company P here, it, the beta of its shares is 1.8, so although I'll put the whole thing in the formula in a minute, uh, beta E is 1.8. Would you agree? Beta D is the beta of debt. Remember, we're a good company. Beta, uh, beta D is the beta of debt. Now then, it's the same in P4 as it was at F9. Although in real life, hello, debt will be risky. There's always a risk. We say the risk of debt is very small because clearly debt, you are getting fixed interest. There's no risk there. But the risk, of course, is the company might collapse and you lose your interest. You would agree? Well, we always ignore that. In the exam, you always assume for this formula, you assume the debt is risk-free. Now, it's only for this formula, but we do. Certainly in this exam. 
We assume the debt is risk-free. There's no danger of the company collapsing. In which case, what is the beta of the debt? Zero. Uh, and of course, if the beta is zero, all of that last bit disappears. Which I always find very funny. I can imagine the examiner just sat there giggling. Why didn't he just put the little bit of formula? <laughs> because obviously it looks ten times worse, you know. But the last bit of the formula disappears. Uh, if you get the chance, write that down. You know, but you would always assume that in the exam. Okay? Finally, V, E, V, D. I won't actually write, I haven't room, I've written above. But they're the market values of debt and equity, so it's like a gearing ratio. T is the rate of tax. Okay? And so, let's just do it for P, it doesn't take a moment. Um, you may think I'm childish, but it's very easy to make silly mistakes. We need market values of equity. Nobody's listening to me. Oh, I'll talk to this. It's, it's looking at me. Now, you may think I'm very childish. On some occasions, he may actually give you um, extracts from balance sheets and things. And no problem. If, you know, if you've got the balance sheet, if you know how many shares and you know the market value, you know, it's... Equity might be 10 million, total market value, 10 million, debt might be 2 million, you stick the figures in. If he gives you a ratio like we've done here, I don't know the actual market values, but I don't need them. I do only need a ratio, if you're with me. But it is very, very easy to do something stupid. <clears throat> you may think I'm childish, but I don't care. I always write down... And make sure I've understood the ratio. I've given you the ratio of debt to equity. Well, choose any numbers you want. But if equity were 100, the debt would be 40. Do you agree? The total would be 140. Any numbers you like, but the point is... The way he's defined gearing here, the debt is 40% of the equity. Happy? Well, fine. I don't care whether the real market values are 100 million, 40 million, 200 million, 80 million. It's the ratio that matters. Now I stick it in. Uh, equity VE is 100 over equity 100 plus the debt VD is 40 times 1 minus the tax rate. The tax rate here is 30% or 0.3, 1 minus T, 0.7. Are all three of you clear where the numbers have come from? Well, it's that ratio, if you like, times the beta of equity, which is 1.8, which I think gives us... I will write it down precisely, although in the exam I would normally leave it to two places. I get 1.40625. Has anyone checked me? I say in the exam you usually leave it to two places, 1.41. Alright? And be clear what that's told us. It's saying if there was no gearing at all, the share would have a beta of 1.4. And if there was no gearing at all, the only risk would be the risk of oil or the risk of tele the risk of the business. Clear? Also, it may seem unnecessary, I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it. Uh, none of you are perfect. You know, you can do this every night for a month. On the middle of exam is where you make silly mistakes. Well, apart from Redder, who looks as though... No, you, you know what I mean, Redder. Anybody does. But, you know, use a bit of sense. We can all press the wrong button or something. But if you understood me, the beta without gearing, it has to be lower than 1.8. It has to be. 
We can all press the wrong button, but if you've got 1.9 or something, at the very least you must write down, it's obviously wrong. It can't be higher, you know. It would have to be lower. All right? All right, well, yet again, you may have done it while I was talking, but can you do the same for Q, please? And tell me, which of the two is the more risky business? Yeah, once you've got the arithmetic, it's easy. Uh, the main, the main, uh, I don't think it's the arithmetic that's the problem. It's just be so careful, you make sure you've got it and using the right figures in the right place, that's all. But finally, of course, the relevance of it. We knew that, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we knew that P was the more risky share. Yep. We expected that anyway, because P had more gearing, you know. But if I wanted to know what was the more risky business, ungear it, the asset beta measures how risky the business is. Well, as it turns out, it is still P that's higher. So P is the more risky business. But, clearly it's not as much higher, if you understand me. And would you all agree with different figures? It could just as easily have been Q that was the more risky business, you know. So, I, not much there, but uh, critically important, it is ex at F9 it was possible, but very, uh, well I still don't think he's actually asked it, or maybe once. At P4 it's extremely likely, it's almost certain, that you'll be needing to ungear a beta. All right? Read very carefully, but do appreciate published betas are betas of shares. If ever you're given a beta in the exam, read very, very carefully, check what beta they've given you. But almost certainly it would say it's the beta of a share in X, you know? Almost certainly any betas they give you will be the betas of its shares. Okay? If he doesn't tell you, but read carefully, if all he said was the beta of X was this, assume any betas given are uh, share betas or equity betas. Unless, of course, you're told different, obviously. Are we all clear here? You know, read very carefully. But if you're ever left thinking, oh shit, what beta's he given me, you know. Well, since the published ones are the beta's of shares, you would assume, and write the assumption down. You know, you might have missed a bit of word or something. Here is a sensible exam, even if you've missed a bit of word, you still get credit, you know, but... Say you've assumed it's the share beta. Okay. All right, well, again, I'm sorry all that took a long time, especially when some of it was revision, but it's just too important. Uh, the relevance of it, though, just turn only for 10 seconds to question 11. Let me explain where the problem lies. The sort of question you're very likely to get in the exam is this. X is an oil company, and it's geared. Its gearing ratio is 0.4. Shares in X have a beta of 1.48. They're considering investing in a new operation to build ships. 
Okay, a new project. Now, sorry, before you carry on reading, before you carry on reading, this is an extract from what is so often happens in the exam. They're going to do a new project to build ships, and then you'd probably get all sorts of cash flow information. It'll cost 10 million, it'll last 10 years, it'll give these cash flows and so on. So a lot of the marks will be setting up your cash flows like you said you knew, all right? Hello? But of course, having set up the cash flows, we need to know how to discount, or what rate to discount at, to make the decision. You would agree? Well, we, our project is building ships. We've found a quoted shipbuilding company, and there's a bit of information about this other company, why. And our job is to decide how we, what rate we're going to use to discount the project. Okay? So, there are two problems here. One is that, fairly obviously, the new project, the risk of it's different than the current risk. At the moment we're an oil company and we are building ships. You agree? And if you think back to what I said this morning, if the project is more or less risky, we can't just use weighted average. True? Everybody. I said the other problem is, how are you raising the money? Well, I've said it's going to be financed. The exam will only have one way, but I've put three. We're going to finance it by equity. Or maybe it's going to be equity debt, or whatever. Clear? In the exam, you won't have a series. He'll tell you, this is the project, it ships, you know, we're currently oil. This is the way it's financed. Well, if we're changing gearing, if we're changing, if the level of risk is changing, we can't use weighted average. I hope I made that clear. The problem is what this discount rate you're going to use, you know. We need to discount. Is it going to be 10%? Is it going to be 20%? You, you understand? Mm -hmm. So that's where everything we've just done is likely to be relevant. But that bit alone could easily be eight marks of the question deciding on a discount rate. You know, you have another 10, 12, 15 marks setting up your cash flows. All right? But easily eight marks here. After the break, it is, it really should be really quick, if you've understood me. It's not hard at all. Okay?